Hey, this is Holly with Wild Blessings, another Teaching Tuesday, and we are riding nature's waves September the 27th, telling you what's out there uh, free for the knowing and the picking. But today is just such a special class because my mentor, one of my dear friends, Serene, is here, and um, she's going to be able to share some of her wild wisdom. And this woman literally lit a wildfire under me along with other people, but man, I, how long have we known each other? Was it 2008? It was. 2008. Yeah. So she's a real mover and shaker in the green community here in the high country. People have such deep respect for her. Um, she has started schools and camps and um, what haven't you done? <laughs> it's amazing. So she'll tell us a little bit about that. So um, thank you for coming. I'm glad to be here. We're going to have a lot of fun because I'm going to go over nature's wave and she's only allowed to talk for, what, five seconds on each plant oh. as we go. I know that'll be very hard. <laughs> <for sure. laughs> and then we'll dive into Serene and into what she's, um, how she is such a, a wild blessing for sure. Okay. So let's talk about first what I'm doing and the reason what I, why I'm talking about this right now is because chestnuts are out. They start coming out at the end of September. When do, when do you think they're over? Um, right before Halloween. Okay, yeah. so now's the time. Yeah. And they're just beautiful. And this is what they look like. I'm sure you have chestnut stories. Oh, yes. Just tell me art. two things about chestnuts that you love. One is that the children love to play with them. Mm -hmm. and create them into their fairy houses mm -hmm. as HUD yes, houses. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. Great idea. And secondly, that they're coming back. Because the American chestnut, chestnuts? Well, we're working on it through the University of Tennessee. Oh, my god! And it is a blessing. The, there Are you was there's been some success? Yes, wow. there has. And there's, I participated about a decade ago planting 24 down in Turtle Island Land Preserve. That came from the university, and, and they're 99% they true American chestnut genetics, wow. and they produce food. This will change our forest back to being healthy again. Wow. Um, there is an American chestnut on 194. I'll take you there tomorrow morning. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's a genuine one. Um, so, yeah, we used to have 4 billion of them all over from the, on the East Coast, all the way up to Maine, down to Florida, to the Mississippi River, and... We lost them due to the... The blight. The blight, 1904. Yeah. And by 1950, they were all gone. They were gone. Yeah. yeah. This, uh, due this... to bringing in the Japanese chestnut, which mm -hmm. did not have an issue with the blight, obviously, because they're the ones that brought it here. Yeah. Immune system. So this is made out of the uh, chestnut. Wormy. Yes. This, the, the wormy chestnut. Why do they call it wormy chestnut? Uh, because when the blight hit, the worms came in. Oh. So before that, there was no wormy chestnut. This was a, a novelty for builders, is to have the artistic beauty of the worm holes through the wood. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I did a class today on chestnuts, and Tracy came, and we had the best time, and we went foraging, and we filled our baskets. It was so much fun. And I just wanted to briefly show you um, that how to process them because if you do something you actually can own it if I just talk to you about it it's not the same so a lot of people have done um, first of all when you harvest them make sure you're wearing closed-toed boots <laughs> or shoes and wearing gloves because these things really hurt have you ever stepped on one? Oh yes <laughs> oh you know you're there <laughs> yeah, you, that's worse than a Lego <laughs> okay so so what people have done in the past is they've made like an X in the um, chestnut it's like cooking a potato sure like if you don't open it up and you roast the chestnut in an open fire or in the oven, it will explode. And so you need to open it. So a lot of times people would do an X and that's what I've done all these years. And I just watched a YouTube video about just cutting them in half. And so after we do that, and you have to be super careful because it can really use a sharp knife, um, but you wanna cut it directly in half. And then you've got a water boiling on the stove, like a hard boil, you can probably hear it. And then you take these, um, cut in half ones like this, throw it into the boiling water and bring the water up to a boil again. Can you put these in for me? Indeed. Bring the water up to a boil again and then we will drain them out and I will show you what to do with them then. So you want to basically just take that skin off. So these I just did right before class 
And um, so these are parboiled. They're not cooked. They're just parboiled. And th yeah, there we go. Oh, here, hon, these need to go in too. Oh, yes. I already had them done earlier. So there they are, parboiled, ready to go into recipes. And if you guys comment, I put together four pages. Hun, bring those over. They're right next to, right there, the recipes. Oh, yes. Um, so I have like how to roast chestnuts, chestnut flour, chestnut soup, chestnut pizza crust, chestnut cookies, and honestly, they're gluten free. And so it's a superfood. It used to be called the bread tree because it, you can make um, purees out of it, you can make bread out of it, and the gluten factor, like the chew factor of the bread with with the flour made with chestnut, is very similar to regular bread. So I cannot wait to share these recipes with you. There's four pages of them. So if you comment, I'll be happy to send them to you. Um, and let us know you're there and say hi to Serene. <laughs> so I want to just get through this so that I can share with you um, so she can share as much as possible. But so you want to gather your nuts and you want to make sure that um, they don't have holes in them, that they, um, this part here, just throw away. Um, if they have holes in them, it means they have some grub in there or whatever. And also, you want them firm. You don't want them to squeeze in like they have air inside of them. These are beautiful. This is the perfect time to get them. What's that so, little part did you say to throw away? Show me what you're um, This little crummy thing. And um, the shells... Okay, so tell me, Serene, how do you tell the difference between this and a buckeye? Which we're... Ah. Just, do you see my buckeyes anywhere? I think they're over here. Let me see. There they are. Yeah. yeah, that might help. Yeah. <laughs> okay, hon. So, so this is a poisonous look-alike, and it's really important that you um, don't consume buckeyes. So my first indicator would be that buckeyes do always have a misformed side. It oh. is part of their shell, and they have an air pocket on the inside when they're growing. I didn't know that. That's how they, why they have that. She has crazy wisdom. <laughs> okay. And then also, what about the tail? Oh, yes. There is no tail on a buckeye. Mm -hmm. But there is one on a chestnut. Yeah. All the tails of the food and how it sustained us and nature for so long is hanging out right there. Mm -hmm. And we were just talking about how important it is to use all of our senses. And honestly, you use your senses by touching these, these husks. Yes. And the, they're called burrs. Or like if I were to put a, a buckeye in your hand and a um, chestnut in your hand, you should be able to, with your eyes closed, tell which one is which. This one has the tail, and the poisonous one does not have one. But they do have very similar, um, see that little buckeye look on it? Mm -hmm. Very similar colors. Um, but buckeyes are so much fun to play with, so it's, they're, a, they're a good thing. Okay, um, then you get them boiling, back up to boiling again, so now you need to go get them. Okay. And strain them off into, let's see if I've got my strainer here, yeah. So just pour them all in here. And this is so cool, guys. I can't wait to show you how fun this is, so let's bring this over. All right, so now this is very hot. And you should wait till they cool a little bit, but I don't have time for that, so I'm just going to show you quickly what you do with a pair of pliers. I have your pliers, Chase. So you take the pliers and you just <laughs> pull off. Watch. Look how cool this is. See how it can just pop right out. Isn't that fun? So then you've got these parboiled and ready to go into making purees or mousses or cakes or, or butters. Now the flour, you're going to want to roast these in the oven until they're kind of brittle and they get very hard. And then you put them in a blender until you get them like a polenta size, like a cornmeal, or you can make them really fine for baking and it has a wonderful chew factor. So that's easy. That's super easy. So you put them into parboil, get it up to boiling again, dump it out, and then you need to release them from their shells while they're still hot or they'll get sticky. <laughs> and then you have to reheat them. So these are all ready to go. Okay, perfect. perfect. Then we made some risotto today, which was amazing with some sherry, and um, we put some autumn olives in there. All right, so let's go ahead and start with roots. So, Serene, what roots do you like to gather this time of year? 
One of my favorite roots to gather at this time of year, besides our most familiar dandelion and burdocks, which are extremely important for the change of season. Why is that? It helps your body decompress, refill its gallbladder, clean out the liver, and prepare the kidneys for winter, which mm. is very different than spring and summer. So if you were making a tincture out of the burdock and the dandelion root um, in the spring, as compared to in the fall, would it be for different purposes? Not necessarily, but I find that the constituents in the fall roots are more bitter, mm -hmm. have more tannins, mm -hmm. and have a lot more alkaloids and, and uh Okay. The benefits to them. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, they're, they're Or you could just eat ready. them. Like, I eat burdock, like, every day. All the time. All the right. time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, These, this one's not... It's not... Letting go. It's, me. it's making a liar out of me. It's supposed to just pop right out, which all of these did. So go gather your chestnuts and process them, and I'll be happy to share with you these amazing recipes. Our drink today is sumac aid with blackberry, and the sumac is um, right here, and you want to gather them now. Actually, all of August and, and September is a good time to gather it. And then put the berries into a, a jar that you um, fill it up with. And then I mixed it with blackberries that I gathered with Max in July. So you want some serene? Yes, please. Thank you. All right. So the roots are a good time to gather, especially here. Click. Cheers. Cheers. Mm -hmm. mm. That's good. Oh, it's sweetened with monk fruit, which is one to one. Oh, Isn't that good? That is so good. <laughs> the sumac has a lemony flavor. Yes. A wonderful replacement for lemonade, quote unquote. Yes. And way more beneficial than lemonade. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. High in vitamin C. Um, and there's just so beautiful. Okay, let's see what it's on our counter. So we talked about the chestnuts. What do we have here? What can you tell me about this? That is an abundant meal in one mushroom, high in protein, high in calcium, which is not very often found in the plant world. Mm -hmm. um, what is it? it our chicken in the woods. Chicken in the woods. It tastes yes. just like chicken, guys. It really, really does. That's unbelievable. I made like a Chick-fil-A sandwich for my son when he was home, and he thought I had breaded it and everything and fried it, and he thought it honestly was chicken. Was chicken? <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. If you find out, you're in for a treat. Indeed. Okay, what can you tell me about this? These are our wonderful autumn autumn berries. Mm -hmm. They are considered an invasive plant. They are. But yes. you can replace so many things in your in your refrigerator and your tomatoes, your fruits. It's so high in oxi antioxidants, it blows the water out of almost everything else. And mm -hmm. like we said, it's invasive. So what do we do with invasives? Eat them. Eat them. Yeah, but if you can't beat it, eat it. That's right. <laughs> so I have to tell you, I went to the most amazing place on Saturday. I went to Patterson School Incubator Farm down in Happy Valley, which is below Blowing Rock and above Lenore. And it's 1,400 acres of the most beautiful land. And so, Kitty, thank you for inviting me. I just had the best time. And I had wonderful students that came to learn with me and um, to look at the weeds on the property. And the trees there are enormous. They're just so mature. Uh -huh. Like beyond belief. Like a real So forest. while I was there, um, she said, Holly, I have a spice a spice bush uh -huh. forest in the woods and I'm going well I don't even I don't have a spice bush so can I go dig one up so afterwards I went and got let me go get it real quick yes uh -huh. it's right here uh -huh. so she it's looking a little sad but Serene's going to tell me how to, to save it how to yes. save it <laughs> all right. it's peeing all over the floor <laughs> oh my gosh okay well I'm going to leave it in there but yeah. he, here it is and it's looking kind of sad can I make this still live it's been in water ever since I came back yes you can this if we cut it down to here and replant it in the spring she will regrow herself okay she's going to get ready to go dormant anyway okay so the trauma of digging her up at this time of year is why she looks like this okay and but it'll come we, back mm -hmm, we want as much uh, branch and trunk as we can manage 
almost equal to the amount of root that you actually make off with. Okay. Uh huh. So, so it was full of berries. Um, the whole forest of them was full of yes. beautiful berries. So tell me what you do with those. So I have always used the leaves, the berries, and the bark and small stems in tea and in cooking. And spice bush is really effective against microbials. It's also extremely powerful with fever. So typhoid fever and a lot of invasive uh, viruses that the natives were exposed to, that's when it became powerfully medicinal or they started using it so powerfully medicinal. Before that, it's the change of season. Once again, a tonic to prepare you for winter. Wow. Mm hmm I'm yep. excited. Yeah. Well, we we got to stop talking about spice book, but I mean, you have to tell me more later. Yes, I yes. want to know. <laughs> okay, this here, I have to tell you guys. Jason and I tried our best to be gardeners and farmers, and this was our potato harvest. Pitiful. I mean, look how small <laughs> they were. So this, what's this, hun? This is our Jerusalem artichoke. This is a Jerusalem artichoke, and, or people call them fartichokes because they are very gassy. Right. But I've learned how to deal with them if you ferment them. Okay. Did you know that? That makes sense. It, it works. Yeah. Um, if you feel these leaves, it feels like you're putting your fingers on um, sandpaper. Sandpaper. And, or going against the nap or something. Mm -hmm. Really weird. So you want to find, look how beautiful. This is in the Asteraceae family, the sunflower family. And the roots, you can buy them at Earth Fair or you can just dig them up because they're all over the place. Uh huh. And, and you'll, if you plant this in your garden, mm -hmm. you will have it forever. And it, it'll reproduce. Constantly. Yeah, it'll take over. Mm -hmm. So this is something you want to be intentional to bring to your land. Yes. And if you don't have any, I have plenty. You can come get a root from me. They're tubers, right? Yes, they're tubers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and they taste exactly like potatoes. Like a potato. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's see what else I've got real quick. Um, she's going to talk about goldenrod because it's one of her favorite allies. Um, I found a lot of butternuts today when I was foraging with Tracy, and they look like um, footballs and feel how... Feel, yeah. They're so <laughs> sticky. They're really sticky. And they taste like buttery pecans, just delicious. And I made a cheesecake recently with the crust made out of acorns and the butternut, and it was amazing. Um, of course, we've got the sumac, which we talked about. Oh, the acorns. Look at all these acorns, guys. Every day, Max yes. and I collect 100 of them underneath <clears throat> the chestnut oak at the top of my mountain. And then I dry them in the dehydrator for just 20 minutes or so. And then I've been, um, I need to really process these <laughs> and get these shells off. How do you, tell me just something, give me a quick story about acorns, because you guys need to be collecting acorns now. Yes. Why? Um, because they're not here later. The animals <laughs> will get them. <laughs> okay, but why do we um, want them? Uh, well, some, this is a very, very powerful source of carbohydrates and protein. Mm -hmm. Once again, not easy to find these two qualities in the forest. So we go back to our nuts. The chestnuts in particular. Uh-huh, chestnuts in particular. But acorn is everywhere right now. In this time and era of our forest, we're trying to bring back the chestnuts. So acorn is a great replacement, quote-unquote. Mm -hmm. of the chestnut um, also very high in tannins which we process and soak out most of mm -hmm. when we want to eat it because yeah. it doesn't taste very good cold leaching I taught you about that last week so if you haven't watched that watch it mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. but it's a great flour so we can replace a lot of our glutinous flours mm -hmm. and flours that aren't even grown on this continent Mm -hmm. And here is a wonderful replacement that is extremely, it's not hard mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. Although this flower, the chestnut flower, has a better chew factor, I think. Right, yes, and, it does. Um, so this is, I think, an easier replacement. And this was used for bread before wheat. Yes. Did you know that? Yes, it was. Um, yeah. Well, and, and, and also in particular here, you mm -hmm. know, wheat wasn't prominently farmed mm -hmm. by the natives. So this wasn't something that was more of a foraging plant in the meadows mm -hmm. when you would come across to true wheat. Um, but this and chestnut was where you got your flour from. 
Right, so part of riding nature's wave is you've got to get it while the getting's good because it's not going to be around later. Yes. So that's why I'm saying take advantage, and especially before all the leaves drop, because once the leaves drop, then all those nuts are kind of hidden under the leaves, and then it's the squirrel's chance. Uh -huh. So this is our chance now, so I just wanted to, to encourage you to do that. So we've got the chicken in the woods, the chestnuts, the autumn olive berries, the butternuts, the acorns. Um, I roasted the acorns to make into coffee. And that, have you yes. ever tried that? Uh huh. We're gonna do a class someday, guys, on all the things you can make coffee out of. Did you know you can make them out of cleaver seeds? I did not. Yes, you can. That makes sense. So it's yeah. so crazy, and that even has caffeine in it. And it does have caffeine in it. Yeah. <laughs> Is that nuts? Uh huh. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. And then let's see. I guess that's it. And so I just wanted to go back to my main purpose for this class is just to to feature my beloved mentor and friend serene and have her tell us about her story how did you even get started on the green path um well as a little girl i grew up in rural in indiana and my mother taught me about eating dandelions and wood sorrel and sweet things like this that were common in the yards and through that, not being afraid, I started t tasting plants myself. Uh, by the time I was 15, I was buying herbal books and looking in to what was out there in my botanical community. My own health issues since being an infant told me that I wanted to find more holistic, uh, well-rounded, and easier for my body to acclimate to health and wellness than what the pharmaceutical companies had to offer me. Mm -hmm. um, then I started traveling out of high school and ran into wonderful teachers like Seven Songs and Frank Cook. Yeah. And what a privilege. Yeah, and a lot of us Green Pathers were all in that same age group mm -hmm. and discovering it together. Um, had my first daughter, moved here to the Appalachians, saw all my botanical friends, and I've been here doing it ever since. Yep, but she doesn't just keep it to herself. It's like, you can't keep it to yourself. No. <laughs> she started Two Rivers. You were one of the founders of that. I was. Uh -huh. about that? So we wanted to have another form of education for the kids here in the high country and keep the intactment of nature, ecology, responsibility, and community as a backbone to learning all the other fundamentals that everyone needs to have or is expected to have to go out into the world. So we founded Two Rivers Community School and within that we developed a MAP program or Mountain Adventures program linked with Buffalo Cove and wrote a charter for that and our children go on to Buffalo Cove Land Preserve and start studying in kindergarten and do extraordinary expeditions all through Western North Carolina all the way until they graduate our school. And it is actually part of their curriculum. It is mandatory and they are graded for it. Um, well, and also a nature smart child is a rare bird. Truth. And if you can be a nature so can you describe what a nature smart kid is and what kind of an advantage they have? for that those skill sets mm, okay so I consider that being somebody that is sensitive attentive and aware and has a sense of responsibility to what is in their natural world and how it interacts with the people and the animals around them mm -hmm. um, through that uh, love and passion and belief I also founded Roots and Shoots Kids Camp which is amazing. It is amazing. Most adults wish they were children and could take it. Uh, <laughs> and we have two curriculums, uh, one for beginners starting at six years old. And when they feel ready to graduate, they become go from being plant keepers to plant warriors. And in this, they learn basic botany, learning how to key out plants, what is food and medicine, plant families, how to turn things into medicine or food. And we represent that back to the community by putting on an expedition at the end of every session. And so she has literally impacted and changed the lives of hundreds of children. 
and their parents, their whole family. I mean, it's it's a wildfire. It is. It's really neat. Yeah. I'm, it, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you can tell she's she is a visionary, and she uh, she doesn't keep it to herself. It's hard to keep this kind yes. of abundance to yourself. And um, to me, it's all worship. As well. Yes, it's indeed. Like, whoa. Uh huh. Incredible. And giving thanks all and the time. I'm gonna go ahead and let you just take over and just share whatever you want to about goldenrod, and then just okay. give us a ten minute warning. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So yeah, um, here is our wonderful goldenrod, who is being a very very showy botanical friend right now, all year long. For the most part, she looked like a very large weed patch. Um, right now. Being a late bloomer in sense, she is in coming into full bloom. There are 50 plus species of goldenrod east of the Mississippi. And often we point at this friend when we don't know better and blame her for our allergies. Well, this is not true because goldenrod's pollen is moved by insects only. It's too heavy to be blown on the wind. So it's not ever going to get up into your nasal passages and give you allergies. Next to goldenrod is the amazing allergy friend, ragweed. And atypically, they're going to grow right next to each other. Um, goldenrod is extremely helpful with allergies, but also not being that it's full of antihistamines like some plants, but because she's very, very astringent and she's antimicrobial and antifungal. So if you are having an allergy issue, um, you're running, you're making extra mus mucus, your body's trying to protect itself by doing this, this is a great ally to bring in and, and make tea with. Um, you can eat her and you can make, of course, a tincture or something like this with her. Um, infamously known across the East Coast as Blue Mountain Tea. And so for over a century, Blue Mountain Tea was sought out in all of the mass stores and these general stores, sure. And in all actuality, it is goldenrod, and only goldenrod in that tea blend. Solon Dejio is her botanical name, meaning to make whole. Mm -hmm. Solid. Solid. Founded, yeah. strong. Uh, like I mentioned, she's an, uh, very antiseptic. Anti-inflammatory is another wonderful property, also relating to any kind of cold and flu, allergy, but also a wonderful friend to use topically. You don't have to go all the way, as I'm hoping many people are starting to gather. If you don't get it all the way into a hard salve, make an oil. Use the oil. Wonderful friend for arthritis, sore muscles. This time of year when the change of season is coming and we're working so hard, many of us outside, to put the gardens away, to get the firewood in a pile, to clear and get ready for winter. This is a wonderful ally, hence why she's in full bloom right now, waving at you, saying, come get me, and I'm in abundance. She runs through a runner. If you pull one goldenrod plant, you're pulling against the next one and the next one. They're all linked together. Like a colony. Solid, yes. Um, very, very high in antioxidants as well, which brings in the healing properties when we need to fight a cold, when we need more oomph to get over the allergy or oomph to get over the sore muscles and the tiredness of this season. I love goldenrod. And we're really, really blessed, honestly, to have so much in the Appalachian Mountains. It's not as bun abundant or appreciated in so many other parts of the country that it does live in. Holly, isn't it true when you and I were off the mountain last week, we didn't see very much? Down near Lenore and down below the mountain, we didn't see as much golden rod. Yeah, I didn't see very much, but it might have been just where we were. Okay. But we're blessed to have it. So, like, okay, now... You've just now convinced everyone they need it, so what do they do? So you would go and harvest flower and, and aerial parts, any aerial part. Uh, we, we don't harvest the root. Um, dry it and make it into a tea blend. Which is what we're drinking now. Yes. 
or you can take it fresh and turn it into a tincture or fresh this is one plant that doesn't mind going directly into oil really you because don't you don't have to dry it first Why? because it's so high as an antiseptic and in antioxidants okay so nothing's going to grow on it it's an antifungal antimicrobial period so okay i would also put it into honey yes you take like a little jar and then pour pull these off put that into the jar pour local honey over top of that put a lid on it and then flip it over put it on your kitchen counter flip it each time you walk by a couple weeks later it'll be completely infused and then you'll have all of those constituents in, in honey. honey yeah which lasts forever yes yes yeah and, brilliant and that amazing okay, wonderful for guys. burns you also learn by hearing us talk about this you learn by doing it, yep. Mm -hmm. and that was. I'm so glad you caught on to that. <laughs> That's why I know so much people go. How do you know so much, Holly? Because I go do it. Because you do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Messing with it, making mistakes, mm -hmm. learning curve. It's mm -hmm. the best way to engross yourself into plants. And once you're turned on to one, you'll get turned on to another and another. And learning from people like Serene is is invaluable. And she's written a book. And so when it comes out, you guys are going to really treasure it. Can yeah. talk about that real quick? So I have been working on, and it's almost finished, uh, working on an Appalachian, in specific Southern Appalachian, monograph book that juxtaposes Western medicine, Western herbology, Cherokee herbology, and Celtic herbology. And that is really the hold of these mountains, being that that's who lived here and that's who we were honored to be able to learn from. So she'll sign all of your copies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's a scripture in Psalm 104, verse 14 that says, God gave herbs for the service of man. Yes. And these are warrior plants. These are your allies. Okay, so tell us about other allies you want to discuss. Okay, so there is a root that I would like to discuss. And right now is a fantastic fall time is a wonderful time to harvest roots. Yes, spring is too, but I do not believe that it's counterdicted into the fall, um, especially with this lovely small shrub, if you would say. And notice that this is three different styles of leaf. They all exist on the same tree. This is sassafras. Sassafras, we harvest the root by digging down and following along and pulling up uh, a couple runners off of the base of her trunk. Sassafras was the first and biggest export of the colonies. This was because she, the leaves taste wonderful beyond wonderful wonderful mm -hmm. and the root tastes like root beer at that point of time when the palate got turned on and the queen found out that there was this amazing tree in the colonies and the king of france had one put in his botanical garden she wanted it too hence why it became the biggest export of america besides tobacco and actually, if you did not harvest enough sassafras and send it over to Europe, you were taxed by having to turn over more tobacco. Um, so first it becomes a novelty, but then botanical lovers and, and healers discovered that sassafras was working in conjunction with other herbs as uh, against syphilis. And syphilis at this time was a very, very bad epidemic. Um, it is because she is super high in antioxidants and, uh, and antiseptic once again. But there was a fear when science started isolating constituents in plants. And sassafras was thrown to the side as if it was some kind of poison. Well, this is not true if you do not isolate this constituent into an essential oil. Mm -hmm. That is the only time this plant is dangerous. Is the saffril. The saffril. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. But we don't consume that. And that's not how it's used anyway. So this is one of my favorite plants, especially as a, as a easy foraging, first time novelty out in the woods, something to nibble on. It has an abundance. It's a tree. So it's not like picking little tiny chickweed all over the place, you know. Um, I love making root beer. And we will go dig this in the spring or in the fall. If it's a large root, just use the external part of the bark on the root. Okay. If it's a smaller root, use the whole thing. Great to chew on. Great for brushing your teeth with. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very helpful for you that. You have a toothbrush. Yeah. Antiseptic. It's an antiseptic and an antimicrobial. So you're cleaning your mouth with the stem of a sassafras. Mm -hmm. And it's a great thing to chew on while you're busy and looking around. Mm -hmm. So this is one of my favorite. I call it Fall the salad times. tree. The salad tree. And have you eaten the flowers? Aren't they delicious? Yes. The flowers are edible. They come out before the leaves in the spring. Yes. Kind of like a, a like a witch... Uh, a witch hazel and uh, it reminds me also Colt's foot acts like that. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So she is another that puts out her flower before these leaves are even opening up. She also, tell her about the filet. Oh, yes. So filet is made from this. Have you ever made it? No. Uh, I've watched Mark do it. How do you do it? Uh, I was busy. In another corner. Uh -huh. I think you just dry it. I, I think so, too. And was it Doug Elliott said that you do them in the fall leaves? In the fall leaves, and you dry it, and you use that to make the filet. You, you grind it. Mm-hmm. Into okay. a powder. Because it's so mucilaginous, it actually makes your throat feel moist. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like, if you are really thirsty and you don't have any water, you can eat a violet leaf, or you can or eat Or you can eat this, and it'll give you hydration. Mm -hmm. And they're sweet. Very sweet. Yes. I like to just take them and chop them small and put them in a salad. Yes. And mm -hmm. you can eat it just that. Just like this. With basswood leaves. Those are my Oh, favorite. basswood. Yes. Yes. I just found a sapling and planted it in my backyard. Good job. Basswood. Good job. Yeah. yeah. Bring it to your land. If you don't have it, bring it. Bring it. And these do often grow. They. I've never found a sassafras tree by itself. They love to grow in groves. Mm -hmm. So you will find babies. And they don't mind to be moved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Okay, what else? Uh, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't carry too much more in here. Well, um, right back here. Oh, yes. Let me see. So here's an ally that uh, she's not past her prime yet. But I think it's very important to go ahead and retouch on this plant. She does not have a flower on her, probably because Holly walked around and ate them all. But um, if you see here, there's her little seed pod. This is our native touch-me-nots, or jewelweed. And jewelweed is remarkably known. Here's the little seeds. Mm -hmm. They taste like walnut. And this would keep a child very, very busy while you're doing farm chores, Holly, discussed on the way. <laughs> I will need a whole cup, child. <laughs> but um, this is a, a very important ally we know because of Sister Ivy. And I have renamed, and many of us on the Green Path have renamed Poison Ivy to Sister Ivy because she is doing a job. She is holding the border of disturbed land. And it is Ivy's job to keep the humans out because the humans are really the only ones that are destroying the forest. Um, so in this wonderful plant, she has the counterpart to the actual saponoid that makes us break out with Ivy and runs 10 times faster through the bloodstream than Ivy's poison can. So if you use jewelweed before you go out into a field or start weeding a space that you know that ivy may be living in or you already know it lives there, um, you have blocked the receptors in your, in, in, in your skin and you cannot get ivy. It will hold its space. 
so the IV just dis dissipates your body, gets rid of it. But you have to take it preventatively? You do not have to take it preventatively. Good question. Um, but it is useful as a preventative as well as a cure. So she also will help you your IV go away. This works on eczema. It works with bug bites. Any kind of skin itch, ailment, roughness, rash. How would you use it? Jewel weed. I, we use the aerial parts, not necessarily the flower, but the green and the stem, which if you find a bigger specimen than this, it's hollow and has lots and lots of mucilogenic juice, juice just dripping out of it. Mm -hmm. um, so what I do is I chop it up real, real fine, and I either put it into water and freeze it into ice cube trays to use when I'm kneading it, or I go ahead and I make an oil. You can make a jewelweed salve. Some folks go as far as making a jewelweed soap, and when they come in from the forest or the garden, they use their jewelweed soap to wash, and it really, really does stop poison ivy. So even though she's close to coming to her time, it's not too late to go out and get yourself plenty of jewelweed um, and put it up for when you're going to need it. Springtime is one of the most invasive and dangerous times to be around Sister Ivy because the baby plant is so potent. Mm -hmm. um, jewelweed is barely coming up then. So it is important to go ahead and already have it on hand when the season comes in. Have you ever eaten their cotyledon leaves? Yes. Are they delicious? They're delicious. Yeah. And I don't mind nibbling a little bit of it fresh, but uh, it is advised to go ahead and cook it with other greens. Um, I think that honestly comes down to the teaching that once the plant is in flower, this oxalic acid is high. So when you cook, you're removing a lot of the oxalic acid. Another trick to get rid of oxalic acid or at least help your liver push it through is to eat dairy because the dairy, the oxalic acid latches on and to the lactose and it will be removed from your body. So it doesn't have the chance to build up in your liver. That's right. the big fear. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, I also found a small specimen of Solomon seal. And we know it's not wood seal. Once again, I'm not going to call a plant false. There is nothing false about that plant. That's kind of derogatory. But a true Solomon seal, and its nodes are underneath where the wood seal comes out front. This is where its flower is. Mm -hmm. This one flowers underneath and drops the beautiful little purplish blue berries at each of the nodes. Solomon seal. Long time we walked and, and wondered and were fascinated and long time for me anyway. Um, and in the early 2000s, uh, a real scientific study was done on Solomon seal. If you've ever dug up the root and cut it, it really does have the symbol of Solomon in the middle of the root. So, obviously, it's telling us it's significant for something. What? Besides a little bit of food here and there? We really didn't understand. Well, turns out that Solomon Seal is... This was put out through the Mayo Clinic, and they've still done extensive studies ever since then and put out a report every year. Um, what Solomon Seal does is act as a soft tissue adaptogen. And so your ligaments and your tendons say, so what Mayo Clinic does, because of course they need to go extreme and get it all finited. They did a study with retired football and hockey players. Now these gentlemen have torn their body all up. They've got injuries that they're supposedly going to feel worse and worse and worse for the rest of their lives, some of which could never be fixed by surgery or any form of supplement or you know, touch healing. Well, you take Solomon seal, make a low dose tincture, use it somewhat homeopathically, so two to four drops, three, four times a day, and within a month or so, your tendons, if it's stretched, it's tightening back up. 
if it's too tight, it's loosening back up. I love that. And so it's a, it's helping your body to adapt and do what it needs to do to heal long-term old injuries, which we all have them, not just football players. Well, and also it helps your body create synovial fluid. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what it's standing. doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which doesn't happen oh. really on its own. It's very hard. One, your body struggles very hard to do this. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just an anti-inflammatory. No. Because an anti-inflammatory can be kind of like a band-aid, but the problem is still there. It's it still there. It helps to, to genuinely heal at a core level. Yes. Yes. Fascinating. It is And amazing. wonderful and very powerful. And um, if if you're you're injured and you're still suffering and you think that you know you need to have a surgery these kind of things i really do promote find get finding a, an herbalist that you trust that is making this in the proper way and a, a, attempting to use it for yourself for a couple months before oh that's so cool well mm -hmm. one of the things i love about serene is that um, she has so many plant stories, and, and her stories are personal stories because she lives with the plants, and she's actually lived off the land years ago for many years, and so you know what you're talking about. And so having these personal experiences, going from a stranger with a plant to an acquaintance to a friend to an ally, most of her plants are allies, and she knows how to use them to, for food and medicine and then how to help others with that as well and especially inspiring children yes. and giving them confidence that they've got what they need. I like the fact, can you tell us uh, how, like, not that I want to bash pharmaceuticals, but they're, they're just kind of like a one track, like if you're supposed to lower blood pressure, then it'll lower blood pressure. Right. But One liners. With, one liners. Whereas with their herbs, they tend to do what your body, how would you describe uh, it? Uh, yes. With herbs, your body first has to acknowledge this plant and the constituents that are coming in. We have been very much so removed from the natural constituent world in this modern time, in the time of technology and the industry. Um, so in, in many ways, I'll use a personal example. Um, when I was very young, I was exposed and came into a the herpes simplex in my core meridian. And so I was probably one of the most extraordinary and extreme medical cases of this virus. And for years, I was given pharmaceuticals. Actually, the, the pharmaceutical that is prescribed was found by Eli Lilly testing drugs because I had a cold sore going up my retinal nerve trying to get into my brain when I was in third grade. And so they came in with their scientists and they are testing this and testing that and giving me shots. In your eyes? In my, yeah. Uh -huh. And um, luckily, ign youth. <laughs> if I was an older person, it probably would have been much more tragic. But um, I had faith and knew that this was my way out at that time. So I utilized what was given to me and I also through this discovered that my body did not absorb lysine naturally out of food. And so I was having to take a lysine supplement on a regular, a three, four times a day. And if I wasn't, if I chose, if I didn't, I would have massive breakouts. And when I started traveling and really touching with plants and one, had more wild food in, in my, my diet and in my, my kitchen. Um, I also ran across the ally of lemon balm. Oh, I was going to say that. Yeah. Whoa, tell us how it <coughs> you. So lemon balm is uh, when, if you have a lot of autoimmune diseases, which at this point in time it would be considered an autoimmune disease. It's not just a little tiny canker sore. Um, it comes from a miasm, which is a, a genetic and nerve scar from your great-great-grandmother. And so my great-great-grandmother either suffered from herpes, syphilis, or chlamydia. 
and it left a genetic scar that I inherited. And that made it so that I was so vulnerable when I got exposed to the virus from another little tot. Um, and so when I brought lemon balm into my, my apothecary, um, that is when I really started honestly getting into constitual science and deeper and deeper into anatomy and physiology. But um, lemon balm exasperates the growth of your uh, myon sheath. And if you can imagine, here's a virus that only lives in your nerve. It doesn't live in your soft tissue. It'll never get in your blood. It'll never go anywhere else except for in your little itty bitty nerve. And so as in any time you had a breakout, you broke and cracked and injured the, the sheath protecting your nerve. Lemon balm exasperates the growth of the myelin sheath. And so as I continued to take lemon balm into my body, within a year, I never had to take lysine again and I never used a pharmaceutical again. And I, if and rarely do I ever have a flare-up anymore, my daughter, my middle daughter, she has cold sores. And if you notice somebody that has cold sores or any kind of herpes outbreak, it's always in the same place. That's because the sheath of the nerve is damaged there and it's just a waiting and the nerve, the virus can run through your nerve, run through the nerve, find that little gateway and blow up. By using lemon balm, we don't have those issues anymore. Praise God. It's a miracle. That's a miracle. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So I've been trying to get her to join us for two years now <laughs> and I'm so excited that she's actually here tonight and that you're getting to hear about um, her wild wisdom and her enthusiasm, and I hope that this has blessed you. It certainly has blessed me. Um, I wanted to just let you know that I've got a plant walk on Saturday, and I'll let you know where it's going to be. It'll be from 9 to 11, and of course we'll have our wild snack and our wild drink, and I'm looking forward, yes, I'm looking so much forward to that. So I'll, I'll put a, a link out there that you can sign up to join me, and, um, I guess that's about it. I'm just so honored that Serene joined us. And um, thank you, dear. Thank you. This has been so thank wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, God bless you all. Wild blessings.